Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is the 10th in the series of United Way's Realities of Inequity Sessions, which really focuses on the obstacles people face to achieving economic stability and what really can be done to break down these barriers. So these sessions are based on the findings of United Way's Alice Report, which reveals exactly why so many Marylanders, they can't get ahead. And so let me begin by just defining ALICE for you. ALICE stands for those who are asset limited, income constrained, yet they're employed, hardworking people who can't make ends meet. These really are the people working in one, two, sometimes more jobs, typically those that are low paying like cashiers and clerks, or healthcare aides, grocery store workers, delivery service employees, childcare staff and the like. So they are really essential uh, to ensuring that we can navigate our lives with ease, but they can't afford the essentials. Things like housing, food, healthcare, and childcare because of the cost, the cost of living far outpaces what they actually earn. So to put this in perspective, a family of four, they actually need to earn $87,000 a year just to cover the basics, including transportation. And so low wage positions account for the largest number of jobs here in Maryland. More than a third of all jobs here in Maryland are hourly positions and half of these pay less than $20 an hour. So based on data from our 2018 Alice report, a staggering 39% of Maryland households are at or below the Alice threshold. And that number is without a shadow of a doubt much higher since the pandemic hit back in March of 2020. On behalf of United Way, I wanna thank the sponsors of this important report. Um, you can find the Alice Report, which outlines what people need to earn just to get by in each county in Maryland. You can do that on United Way's website. We dropped the link uh, here in the chat. And so United Way works to provide people with access to really the basic needs many of us on this call take for granted and transportation is key to really connecting people with the resources and opportunities that they need to not only survive, but to thrive. And we have a great panel of speakers here today to talk about transportation barriers and what they're doing to make things better for those they serve. And what needs to really happen, right? To increase access for residents across our region. And so now I'd like to introduce the moderator, facilitator for today's uh, session, Mike Kelly. He's the executive director of the Metropolitan Baltimore Council. Mike? Great. Thank you, uh, Franklin, for that kind introduction. Um, I, I first met Franklin in 2017 on a learning tour that my agency led to Cleveland, Ohio. And part of that tour was touring uh, what they call the Health Line, one of the most widely ridden uh, rapid bus lines in the country. And it was a great opportunity to begin the discussion with Franklin about exactly what the transit and transportation needs are for our region. The Baltimore Metropolitan Council is Central Maryland's regional council of governments. And we produce a lot of plans and reports on a wide range of issues impacting our region, including housing, workforce development, and most significantly transportation. And in that work, the United Way uh, is a tremendous partner. Um, and the Alice Report especially is a critical touchstone for us and a reminder of who exactly we are really doing this work for. For most people, transportation issues are a day-to-day -day hassle. It's traffic jams, it's long commutes. But for people like Alice, transportation issues can mean missing critical time with family, struggling to balance childcare and doctor's appointments, and limiting where you can go to work or school, let alone whether or not you can maintain that employment. Um, in our region, uh, Public transportation uh, is a mix of services. The vast majority of trips are taken on MTA, which is one of the 15 largest transit agencies in the country. Um, at the local level, our jurisdictions operate a series of locally operated services designed to meet the specific needs of, of that jurisdiction. Um, Maryland is one of the only states in the country with a state-run system um, that does not allow for significant formal decision-making from local governments. This system has a lot of benefits, but an unintended consequence is that it has not always fostered the best communication between local and state government in the planning and operation of the service. Uh, to that end, in 2020, BMC produced a study on transit funding and governance 
that explored a series of models for potential reforms to the system. Uh, in this past uh, year, in 2022, the General Assembly, through House Bill 1336, uh, sponsored by Delegate Tony Bridges, established a commission to explore that issue further. Um, and as our local and state partners begin to consider ways to improve the current system, it's going to be very important for us to hear from leaders of a variety of perspectives about what the transit and transportation needs are for their constituents. Uh, to that end, uh, the United Way today has assembled a great group of community leaders who will share their thoughts on the needs of the region, what they're doing to try and break down transportation barriers and the work that needs to be done to provide greater access uh, to the opportunities that transportation affords. Uh, as a housekeeping note, if you have any questions for the panelists, please enter them into the chat and we will try and address those towards the end of the discussion. Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce the panelists uh, with us today. We are lucky to have Sherry Cernick, the co-owner of CRC Restaurants, Joseph T. Jones Jr., uh, the founder, president, and CEO of the Center for Urban Families in Baltimore City, and Len Parrish, the director of Hartford County Community and Economic Development. Um, to start the discussion today, I'd ask each of the panelists to share a time um, that you were confronted with a transportation challenge um, and how you navigated that. And uh, to start the discussion, I'd love to start with Sherry. Okay, hello. Um, I've always heard about issues getting to and from work from our staff at uh, our locations at BWI Airport, but I've never really experienced that myself because I've been very fortunate and have transportation. However, a couple of years ago during a snowstorm, I had offered a ride home to someone who was walking out at the same time with me, one of our line cooks. And as we were driving in the car, I started asking her, what is it usually like to get to work? And basically she lived a little bit north and east of North Avenue. So what she said is she has to take the light rail from BWI into the city. And then at the city, she gets dropped off and walks to a bus station or bus stop, whatever. So at the bus stop, then she has to wait there till that picks her up and takes her out to the next location in um, on North Avenue. Then she has to walk home from there. So depending upon the circumstances, the time of day, whether the everything's running on time or not, it could take her anywhere from an hour on a good day to two hours on a bad day to make it to and from work, a ride which would take any of us in a car about 25 to 30 minutes. And that got me really um, concerned and in tune with the fact that something that I take so much for granted, other people on a daily basis have a struggle with, which kind of led me to get involved with the uh, Central Maryland Transportation Alliance, which is working to improve transportation in the Central Maryland area as well. So um, that is really what piqued my interest in it was learning just how difficult it is every day to get to and from work and how it affects everybody. Great, thank you, Sherry. Um... Joe, uh, I'd love to hear from you um, uh, about the transportation challenges that you faced. So this gets really personal. So since I'm with the, the Baltimore family, I, I believe I can share this in confidence and you all won't share it. You know, but back in the day, you know, I had a, I had a, I had a piece of a car and a piece of a job, right? And I was in a new relationship with a young lady who I happen to have now been married to for many, many years. Uh, but she had a daughter who's my stepdaughter and I am uh, going to work and I have the obligation because it's a new job to get to work on time. But I'm also coordinated with my girlfriend who's relatively new, but we've been together for several months and I uh, had the commitment to pick up uh, then her daughter, now my stepdaughter. And this piece of car that I had broke down on Security Boulevard near where Ingleside and uh, uh, Forest Park come together. And I had little to no resources to figure out. There was nobody to call uh, to borrow a second car, right? I didn't have a second car myself. I also had this baby that I needed to consider how I'm going to pick up as well as to make sure I make my commitment to my new employer. So this one transportation fiasco began to cascade into a set of challenges that would impact my employment, impact my relationship with my, you know, my relatively new girlfriend. And it would strand a, a baby at a childcare center, right? And you know how childcare workers, they work really, really hard. They can give you the side eye when you're late for picking up a child. So that's 
that's my that's my transportation story that's very personal but I think it speaks to a lot of the challenges that the Alice's of the world uh, face when they uh, only have limited resources, may have a vehicle, and the, that one vehicle may be the only vehicle that they have and not an expanded social network they can rely on when they have a challenge. Joe, thank you for that perspective. Um, and it sounds like in the long run, that story had a happy ending. Um, thank goodness, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Len, what about you from uh, from Hartford County? Is there a more uh, sort of rural perspective uh, on this question of a personal transportation challenge? Sure, thanks, Mike. Um, happily, you know, I, I've been blessed and haven't had that many uh, personal challenges necessarily with transportation, but much like Sherry, when we talk about public transportation, um, we like to challenge some of our small business owners uh, to, to try and take public transit to get to their place of employment, um, just to try it, to see what uh, others go through, some of some of what their employees go through. And I think it's often very eye-opening uh, for many of our employers when, um, when we you know, have them start to look at bus scheduling and where they live versus where our fixed route services are and what it would actually take uh, to get to a bus stop, often uh, walking some distance or, or even having to ride a bike some distance just to get to one of our stops. Um, and then once you're on a stop, you know, having to figure out how to transfer in certain areas and how to plan ahead to make sure that uh, you know, when you want to get to your, your end goal, but, um, you know, what connections are there going to be in the meantime? And, and what are you going to need to do uh, to make sure you meet them? You may end up having to take a bus much earlier uh, than expected just so that you can meet one of those transfer points and get to something else. So um, it, it's been really eye-opening for, for people that haven't necessarily had that challenge. Um, once you ask them to, to kind of, you know, walk a mile in those shoes, you know, get, get in and see what it's like uh, to deal with those challenges, it's it's um, certainly eye opening. Great, thank you, Len, and that it really highlights the issue of first and last mile challenges, as well as as operating within the system and going from bus to bus that that a lot of us don't even consider when we start thinking about the challenges of navigating the world through public transportation. Um, Joe, the work of the Center for Urban Families is focused on helping people find jobs um, or improving the jobs that they currently have and with the goal of strengthening Baltimore families. What are some of the barriers you see for your clients as they work towards greater economic mobility? You know, Mike, this is uh, such an important topic and conversation. And thank you to you know, Franklin and the United Way team for teeing it up in the series they've been hosting. You know, just to give people some sense of who it is that we serve. Uh, so we are Baltimore-based, uh, headquartered in West Baltimore in zip code 21217 and we serve all of Baltimore City. Uh, about 65% of the folks that we serve are men and about 70% of the folks who we serve are folks who've had a brush with the criminal justice system, uh, most predominantly men, but also increasingly women who have uh, been engaged with that system. So inherent in, in that is that they come with a set of uh, barriers as it relates to workforce attachment and also 70% of who we serve uh, are parents. So not only do they have an obligation for themselves, they have an obligation for family, in this case, children, and often are you know, living in, in a, an extended or multifamily situation. And so recognizing that they come with a lot of desire, a lot of energy, and a lot of times they come with a lot of sense of hopelessness, right? Because of the challenges that they face that don't necessarily lead to you know, workforce attachment. But I, I want to drill down on, on a couple of things. And I, and, and, and I think one of the things I want people to kind of realize is that child support as an example is a major, major challenge in the communities where the folks who we serve reside. So for example, in the zip codes closest to us, that's the zip code, uh, we're in 21217 and 21215, 21218, uh, 21207 and 21216. They are approximately uh, 8,000 individuals referred to as non-custodial parents. The majority of men are men, but not exclusively. There are women in that number as well. That 8,000 uh, number individuals from those five, five zip codes owe an aggregate of $120 million in back child support, right? And so that means they're at very, 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 very high risk of having, for purposes of this conversation, their driver's license suspended which means if they can't afford to pay child support and often it's not that they don't wanna pay, they can't pay yet because they're unemployed, underemployed. So we're working with them on that trajectory to get into the 
payment system on a regular basis, but they have to have income to do it. Well, if your driver's license is suspended and you need a vehicle to get to work, you put them in a very tenuous situation. And so for us, child support policy as an example of transportation and work attachment is really, really significant. I, I'm really, I was really encouraged this particular legislative session that uh, we had a bill in the legislature, uh, House Bill 844, that would have limited uh, the, the child support system for automatically suspending driver's license while most poor uh, non-custodial parents, those who are less likely to be able to pay. It passed the Senate. Unfortunately, it did not pass the House, uh, although uh, overwhelmingly the folks in the House wanted to see the bill pass. So we're going to have to continue to fight that battle. So right now what happens, I would have to, as an individual, I would have to request the system to give me a break on their driver's license while I'm trying to navigate the world of work. Uh, there's also issues associated with, I think, uh, then it mentioned it before, the last mile. You know, a person, we help a person to get a job and it's in an outlying area and we don't have a vast enough transportation system for folks to be able to get to work in a timely manner, right? And often, uh, if they're able to get public transportation to an outlying area, it still doesn't take them all the way to work. So that means that they have to get off the last stop and then they have to walk the rest of the way, maybe negotiate a ride, you know, with a, another, uh, another employee or coworker. And these are the kind of things that make it really, really challenging. And you also think about the fact that if a person is in that situation, they're fortunate enough to get a job that pays a family sustaining wage or close to it in one of those outlying areas, and they get to work, even including the last mile, what happens when there is a child that has an emergency at school? or some other person that they have to have you know, some responsibility for caring for has a emergency during workouts. How do they negotiate getting to that, uh, that, care, that, that family member, that child, when they don't have transportation? So these are the things that really compound our ability to support people to be uh, stable in their family relationships, but also to be economically successful. And, you know, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, many of our folks have to work, and this comes up in Alice, they have to work multiple jobs to make ends meet. So negotiating transportation to and from multiple jobs in a transportation desert like Baltimore really puts the burden on uh, an individual to navigate that, which just think about what it means for a person who happens to be a parent to have quality time with that child to do homework, to do extracurricular activities, to attend a parent teacher meeting where you really want to focus on the strengths and any limitations that your child may have as it relates to their child's academic success. So those are the kind of things at the center that we really care about, we work on, and we do that in partnership with many others, including in this case with uh, the fantastic work that the United Way is doing. Great, thank you, Joe. Um, my first job out of college, I was a case manager at a uh, men's transitional mm -hmm. home in Baltimore City. And uh, once we had clients in the door, the first place we sent them was up to see Joe. So uh, you were doing great work back then and it's incredible to see the work that you're continuing now. Thank you, sir. Um, Len, um, what are the top reasons people use public transportation in Harford County? And what are some of the challenges of mass transit in a rural area? We don't have time to cover all the challenges, but uh, uh, happy to address uh, uh, some of them. Uh, so the uh, top reason people use public transit in Harford County is still for employment. Uh, I would say probably about 55% of our fixed route ridership uh, is, is using it for that purpose. So uh, certainly employment is uh, a key use, but, oh, you know, of course, medical uh, appointments, things like that. We do have a, a, both a, a fixed route and a demand response service, our demand response uh, is serving more of that um, elderly or, or um, population with disabilities and, and some of those things, getting them again to those medical appointments and dialysis and, and things like that. Um, but uh, certainly on our fixed route uh, services, uh, employment is is a top thing. Uh, my department in particular was designed uh, a, a couple of years ago by merging a few different departments. Um, we oversee uh, everything housing related for the county from homeless services through home ownership. Uh, we oversee community development, uh, economic development, tourism, a couple other things. Uh, but the idea being really, how do we get people from where they live to where they work and back? That's the whole uh, point of our department. It's very purposeful, um, which is, has been helpful because we, we kind of look at things with a different perspective. We're not only looking at it from a transit perspective, 
or an economic development job perspective or a housing perspective. It's how do they all merge? How do they come together? Um, so certainly some of the challenges we've seen um, uh, serving in a rural community is getting to certain areas. Um, we have a, a, a pretty good uh, development envelope along the southern corridor of our county. Um, we serve that area very, very well. Um, around that is kind of a green belt horseshoe uh, of that development area and that uh, more farming, more rural, more um, spaced out um, single family development or even farm community um, that we have difficulty serving. We, we don't have the ability to get out to those areas. Um, certainly funding is a big driver of that. Um, we need to, we'd love to expand our services um, more than what we've done. We've actually been able to expand it to, to run, um, you know, 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. at night. It used to be a 6, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. service. Uh, so we've been expanding some of the hours, but uh, we'd love to do more. We'd love to be able to get that, uh, that second shift home from work, uh, that third shift to work. We'd love to provide some sort of weekend service if possible, even if it's a, a limited Saturday service, but it all comes down to funding uh, at that point. And it, it's difficult to um, really take that, that risk um, to expand service for, for what may only be a few drivers. Um, certainly um, gas prices have, have had some something to do with that. I mean, we are able to buy in bulk as a county and, and uh, make some different uh, contractual things, but um, gas prices, price of uh, goods, getting buses, uh, the actual capital investment of, of getting uh, buses and bus shelters and things like that, um, as cost of goods continues to increase, that affects us. It affects our ability to, to purchase. Um, and then, uh, you know, CDL is, is probably the number one uh, job need in our area. Every company that I talk to um, has that need, that distribution driver need. So we're competing. We're competing with all of those companies. Uh, we're competing with our school systems on uh, getting drivers, just people that can drive our buses and get people around. Um, and certainly that, uh, that competition, um, while good for, for employees because they're able to demand higher, higher uh, incomes and things like that, um, it certainly makes it, makes it a little more difficult on us. And it, it is you know, that, that tight employment market. Um, so you know, those are all, uh, all issues we face. No, thank you, Len. It's um, when we think about transit and transportation challenges, so often we think about the urban core, but our outlying jurisdictions face significant challenges as well. Um, and we appreciate your insights there. Sherry, one of CRC's restaurants is Obricky's um, at BWI Airport, which is always a, a great reason to get to the airport a little bit early. Um, can you share some of the challenges that your employees face in getting to work at a location that isn't exactly in the urban setting? Absolutely. Um, first of all, I think one of the main issues with public transportation is that it's geared towards the Monday through Friday nine to five office workers, whereas most of the service economy are working the other hours. They're the ones and we are the ones who are serving you dinner when you're off of your job, um, taking care of your people that are like taking care of you getting your flight, uh, the people working uh, you know, from first the different airlines and things like that. Our jobs take place on the evenings in the week on the weekends and things like that. Whereas the uh, light rail and bus system seems to be geared towards the other people that are working the regular nine to five schedule. So one of our biggest problems is basically accessibility of transportation. Um, especially at BWI Airport, we open at 4.30 in the morning at Obricky's. We close sometime after 11, depending upon the last flight. And the last light rail is, I believe, 11 o'clock on the weekdays and on Sundays at 8.30. So we have a whole group of people that are working a shift. And when they get off of work, if they don't have a car, have no way to get home. So it's a everyone's trying to close up really fast and rush out, even if we still have guests. So it not only affects what's going on with our staff, but it affects the service levels and the experience that our guests are getting and the reflection that they're getting on the, really on what goes on in the Maryland airport, because everyone's trying to run to get out while our people are trying to get themselves a meal or something to drink. And out of our staff of about 70 people, I would say at least 50% rely on public transportation to get to work. Besides the fact that the hours aren't conducive, there are usually long delays and waits. There's usually a lot of construction. I know right now it's closed uh, to get to BWI. So there's, I think, I believe a bus that goes every so often. So even if the light rail is up and working, it's hard. But then when there's either bad weather or some type of a closure or whatever, it gets even harder. In a snowstorm, in bad rain, whatever else, there's always all kinds of delays with the light rail. 
um, as far as uh, we're a great contributor to the Maryland economy at BWI, not just me. I'm speaking for a lot of other people that have businesses there also. It's a shared problem amongst all of us and it comes up quite frequently, but we can't quite do the solution for it. But um, it's a great contributor to the economy, but we can't even maximize our revenue to pay our rents and our taxes and things like that because we just can't keep the place staffed the way it's supposed to be. And not only does it affect our guests, it affects if the morning shift is there and the second shift isn't arriving, it's hard to get people off at the time they're supposed to get. So there's a complete trickle down effect, whereas if one person is late, it affects mostly anyone within the business, but both people that are internal working for us and the people that are coming in and trying to get their service. Um, so basically, I think it's very important that people are able to get to and from work without stress because we're in a hospitality business and it's hard to be hospitable when you're either drenched from standing out in the rain or you've been in the cold for an hour waiting for your shuttle or your or your you know your bus to get to work or your light rail. Um, and I just feel that it's in the best interest of the greater good that people can get to work and get home from work within a reasonable amount of time. Thanks, Sherry. And I think it's important that you use the word stress there. And, and what you're talking about is, is a need, um, a, a, a worker's need to get to and from their place of employment um, on time and, and how that need can, can turn into a barrier. Um, to that end, in 2019, BMC uh, published a survey of job seekers in the region about the barriers they face seeking employment, all sorts of things. And five of the top 10 barriers were transportation related. Um, the results of the survey showed that 25% of job seekers say that they can't get to work on public transportation. They can't get to the jobs they wanna to get to on public transportation. And a lot of that is because of the lack of access to the second and third shift jobs. Yeah, uh, and it's oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Uh, it's unfortunate because unfortunately, the people that most need to show up for work are the ones that are taking the light rail, not to show up, the ones that most need the money and are living paycheck to paycheck tend to be the people that are working in the service economy and they can't get to work. So they're also missing out on the financial benefits, which can help you get ahead. There's, It's just a, a tremendous circular relationship, I believe, that if you can't get to work, you can't make your money, you can't then work on getting better transportation, getting better jobs. and um, you're sort of grooming people to not realize how important it is to show up on time, ready to work, presenting your best self. But it's not any, it's not their fault, but it just is the way that it is. Absolutely. The um, it's sort of building on this challenge of, of the lack of access to jobs is uh, the fact that the majority of our region's job growth is occurring outside of Baltimore City. The jobs are growing in the places where population has grown over time. And it's very hard for the network to keep up on that. I'd like to pivot the conversation now to talk about what each of you are doing um, through advocacy or through your, your daytime employment to help people navigate these barriers. Uh, Len, let's start with you. You've talked about the challenges faced by transit riders in rural areas, and you've done great work to increase access to meet the transportation needs of Hartford County residents. Can you share one example of what the county government and Hartford Transit Link have done to make this possible? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I did mention, um, you know, expanding some of our service times, things like that, but um, almost more particular for that, I think the, the biggest move that, that we made uh, was recognizing a need um, in what's called our Perryman Peninsula. Uh, Perryman is where a lot of our uh, largest employers are. It's uh, really a distribution hub for the county. so. Uh, we have, you know, Clorox, Rite Aid, Bob's Discount Furniture, um, you know, Amazon's down there, Wayfair, um, Container Store, lots of large, large distribution companies. Um, and we designed uh, a route that would essentially serve just that Perryman Peninsula. It's a, it's a loop that goes down. It was called the Silver Route at the time. Uh, just as a test, we just kind of threw it out there and said, let's see if this will work, um, uh, just to try and help those employers uh, and not only did it work and become one of our full-time and probably our busiest route, um, it, it's the route that we adjust the most, uh, it, almost all the time. We're constantly looking at it, um, trying to, to, to work with each of those employers. Um, one of the things that's been really good is to sit down and, and talk with them about scheduling. Um, so we've done a lot of, of when when is your first shift starting? 
And if it's, you know, we don't want six of them all starting at 730. If they stagger that start time a little bit as it goes down the peninsula, it allows us to deliver people at that, that top of the peninsula at 7 a.m. and towards the bottom at 730. And everybody's making it to work on time. We're not having any issues with, with um, you know, people getting fired because they can't get there on time. That That's um, something that, you know, the companies have had to come together and work with us on. Uh, and certainly something that, that we've worked hard on uh, as well. Um, certainly we take uh, transportation challenges into consideration whenever we're developing uh, any plans and properties uh, in the county with respect to health, education, economic advancement, all, all of those things. Um, and certainly we've been really aggressive at, at trying to go out and find um, available funding sources for those things. So whether that's capital or operating um, uh, expenses coverage, we've, you know, we've done everything we can at that. And then um, certainly I would say um, e even internally um, noting uh, Franklin's reference to the Alice population, um, that certainly is a lot of our employees too. I mean, even that's our uh, both county government employees and, and even Transit Link. Um, so we've done a lot to try and support the Link employees. Um, again, that, that profile of the hardworking people that they can't necessarily afford the high cost of living uh, that we've got. So we've, we've really made a commitment uh, to their ongoing professional growth and how we can um, really work with them to increase their wages and provide better benefits packages for our transportation employees. Great, thanks, Len. Um, it, it, you know, the, the funding challenges that our, our local jurisdictions face in transportation are huge. There's, there's simply not enough money to provide the service um, that, that the residents and constituents demand. Um, and these partnerships and the coordination you're talking about are exactly the right way to maximize those dollars. Um, Joe, in terms of the work that the Center for Urban Families does to assist clients with transportation issues, partnerships are clearly um, a big part of what you guys do. Can you talk about one or two of the partnerships that you forged to help clients address some of these issues? Yeah, first, you know, I think that for us, it's, it's you know, how do you empower people to give voice to the change they want to see. It's one thing for me to talk about it, you know, in my role at the center, but it is equally, if not more powerful and important that folks who are, are the beneficiary of our services, we refer to them as members, that they develop the capacity and the confidence to talk about these issues as they deem appropriate. And for us, one of the key partnerships that help us out, and I think Sherry mentioned this partner earlier, uh, the Central Maryland Transportation Alliance that has a Transportation 101 series as an example of how we can have a partner like the Alliance to be able to help our members to understand transportation policy, to break it down, to make it digestible so that they then can be engaged in some of the advocacy conversations that take place. And uh, one of the most beautiful things that I saw happen uh, a couple of years ago now, you know, with COVID, you're missing out on a year or two when you try to think of time. Uh, but the, uh, the, the Transportation Administration wanted to discontinue certain very popular, heavily used bus routes in Baltimore, including uh, along the Penn North Corridor. And many people suggested this was a, a fake complete, this was this is a done deal. And through the efforts of the Central Maryland Transportation Alliance and, and several others, we were able to organize our members to give voice to it and push back. And to uh, our somewhat to our surprise, but this speaks to the power of people uh, being empowered, the administration changed the position and the uh, bus routes were able to continue. So that's an example uh, there. And then the last one I'll use is, you know, we, we're talking about, you know, like the folks who, who work for Sherry, you know, they may not have a car, but they may be eligible to work for her, right? She's a business owner. So she really needs people to show up and to perform. But if they can't get to the job, right, then <laughs> literally they're not eligible. And so for us, uh, a partner like uh, Vehicles for Change and Vehicles for Change for folks who don't know, they get donated cars and they assess whether or not the car has certain value. If it does, then they will refurbish the car and they'll make it available to someone who has, uh, a, generally speaking, a low wage job, right? Uh, it has a, a, a marginally okay price tag and it comes with a limited warranty. They can use that car as a starter car. However, they have to be employed first 
to be able to qualify to get the car. So we now need to think about how do we take advantage of those opportunities. So when Shari needs somebody to show up on time, they have access to a vehicle and vehicles for change is one of those partners that really help us think through that. And I'll just say one short story in, 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 in 10 seconds. Young man uh, comes through, he gets a job uh, with one of our employer partners, Whiting Term, right? He gets a income, a starting income of $47,000, right? He's single, but he's in a relationship. Fast forward, he and his fiance are getting married next month. They have purchased a home in West, excuse me, in East Baltimore. But the reason why he was able to get that job because he was able to secure a vehicle that would allow him to work in, a, in the construction industry and get from job site to job site. So transportation is one of the most essential tools that we have to have in place for folks to have meaningful employment, all right, and to navigate the terrain in the Baltimore metropolitan area to uh, have stable families and to be economically secure. Great, thank you, Joe. Um, it, you know, partners like Brian O'Malley at CMTA yes. and Marty Schwartz at Vehicles for Change are absolutely critical um, for all of us on this panel and the work that we're trying to do to change the system. And I think it's important that you pointed out um, the, the importance of having a car. Um, transit and transportation are, are not always exactly the same thing. And three quarters of the trips people take in our region are taken on cars. And um, as much as we're hoping and striving to improve the public transportation system, the reality is that access to a vehicle means access to economic opportunity. Um, before we transfer over to Sherry, um, I'd like to ask Franklin uh, to talk to us a little bit about some of the United Way's efforts to tackle transportation issues for the people that they serve. Um, Franklin? Thank you, Mike. Uh, just because of time, I'll be very, very brief, Mike. Uh, this has been a phenomenal conversation. Thank you so much, Sherry Lynn uh, and Joe, for elaborating in such a beautiful way. Big, big, tough issue. United Way, as all of our listeners probably know, is very deeply aligned with this work. A lot of our neighborhood work it intersects so nicely and it connects so deeply with this ongoing need for transportation support. One example that some of the folks who are participating today may be familiar with, we have a tremendous partnership with Lyft. So an individual who's in need of a ride to and from a job interview, a vaccine appointment, some other sort of uh, appointment, they can call 211 Maryland Helpline, right, which is available 24 seven. They can call that number, get actual support from the connection we have with Lyft and get that ride complimentary, right, to and from. So it's a tremendous sort of wraparound to everything we've been talking about today. I could point Mike probably to three or four other examples <laughs> that we're engaged in now, but just really want to sort of continue the conversation. But before that, if there's a short video we'd like to show. When it comes to this job, I love it so much. Even at 5.30 in the morning, <laughs> I really enjoy, I really take pride in my job. Uh, in 2013, I wasn't working a regular job. <laughs> and I was about to lose my house and electric turned off. And it was pretty, pretty hard times for it, but anyway. United Way, man, they had all these programs. They had a lady there to help you with the resumes, to help you get a job, getting your credit right. And they, they, you know, they had like 10 or 12 programs that. It had to be a great job, I'm telling you. It, uh, it's not just a job for me, you know. It's, uh, <sighs> the girl I'm picking up now, she's oh, she is such a good mother, such a good student. I really think a lot of this young lady. Hi, Anthony. Good morning, Miss Carmella. <laughs> Happy boy. I wake up at 4.30, we get dressed, I fix breakfast. We be on the bus an hour and probably 45 minutes because we don't get to school till 7.45. Look at the beautiful sunrise. Bye. Bye-bye, see you later, honey. 
Anthony was about three months when I came to sign him up for daycare so I can get transferred here. They helped me out a lot with Anthony. After that, all my grades, they went up. They way better than I had before I even came here. Like, all my grades is A's and B's. I'm looking at colleges now so I can go to college. Before I even came here, I wasn't even thinking about college. The school is just like a, it's like family. That's how I look at it. Like some of my counselors, I can say social workers, they don't only just do their job, but I feel like they love you too. Oh my God. So this video, um, it shows how we at United Way break down transportation barriers for parents at our family center in South Baltimore's Brooklyn neighborhood. And this family center provides, for those who may not know, free childcare for young parents who are in high school and how a man who was down on his luck was actually able to turn his life around by becoming a bus driver for this family center. And I'm so moved every time I watch this and I think you probably were as well. Very, very touching. I never tire of watching this video and every time I watch it, I'm always reminded how United Way helps make strong people even stronger. And just so you all know, listening, Carmela graduated high school and now has her own home and a good job that pays the bills and that her little son, Anthony, is enrolled in school with other classmates from her United Way Family Center in Brooklyn. And Paul, the driver, is still a dedicated driver with us and much more. And so, so many of the basic needs that we help folks with are interconnected, right? And just as you saw, transportation, it really can be the key to a healthier life. And so Paul and Camilla are just two of thousands and thousands of people we help every single day. And I hope you really enjoyed their stories. And thank you so very much for that. Hey, Franklin, thank you so much. Um, and, and I think I speak for everybody on this chat to say thank you for the work that you and your staff do at the United Way. Um, Sherry, uh, as an employer, can you talk to us a little bit about some of the tools you have to help staff navigate transportation challenges? Certainly, but first I'd like to ask Joe if we could have a discussion after this uh, particular conference about the people that he has that are looking for jobs. If they're uh, able to um, pass a security clearance, we'd be happy to look into some of them if they're interested in working in restaurants. We are in a great hiring mode right now and would certainly welcome the opportunity to talk to anybody that you may have that you think might be a good fit for us. Anything, so, anything for a crab cake, Sherry? Absolutely. Happy to. So basically, I mean, it's not a lot what we do, but we pay for our uh, for the people that drive in. We pay for their parking. They have to take a shuttle from off premises into work. Um, so we pay for that uh, for the people that don't take uh, that don't have parking uh, because they're without cars. We pay uh, allowance towards public transportation biweekly. Um, it covers the amount of what I believe is a monthly bus pass. So that should help people at least be able to afford to not go into debt, just trying to get to work. Um, in addition to that, if there's a snow emergency, we'll usually book hotels that have shuttles from uh, the airport hotels into BWI so people don't miss out on that day of work. In addition, I don't have one, but a couple other people on my team have four wheel drive vehicles. We'll pick people up if they have to get into work and they're willing to. Um, as far as wages, we're not, we're very competitive at BWI. We start basically somebody walking in inexperienced at $16 an hour, which isn't huge, but it's higher than most street locations if you're starting off as, say, a dishwasher or something like that. We prefer to hire full-time employees because we find that there's a loyalty back and forth more that way. And um, people that are working a full-time job tend to take it more seriously if they have to show up for four or five shifts a week than if it's only one or two. And so we feel that that way we get a better turnout on a daily basis from our staff and more loyalty. Um, unfortunately, we've had to go with a very lenient attendance policy, which as I said, works fine to get people into work and but it's bad for overall morale if somebody's trying to leave and the other people haven't shown up. It's also not so great in grooming people for not every job in the restaurant business is necessarily a 
career. It's a lot of times a starting point for people. And they perhaps walk away not realizing the importance of showing up on time and ready to work. Um, basically, uh, you know, we try to do the best we can to uh, get our people to work on time and do the best that they can. And we really believe, though, that accessibility to reliable transportation is an investment in the future and the greater good of Maryland because it really affects everybody. If places, if people aren't getting to work on time, if places aren't staffed the way they're supposed to be, and um, it's just a really, it's a circular thing as we we're all saying. It affects every area of people's lives, not just the workplace, it affects their personal life, it affects them raising their children. And then there's that whole cascade, if you can't get to an appointment or if you can't get to work, how you certainly can't take care of your health the way you're supposed to, you can't pay your bills the way you're supposed to. It's just, it's a, a very important uh, daily need for most people. Great, thank you, Sherry. It's, um, I, I think it's important to hear from employers about um, the, the compassion that they have for their employees and the the uh, efforts that they're trying to make to, uh, to, to run a profitable and successful business, but also to care for the people working for them. Um, and the BWI corridor, um, you know, it's not just a hub for the airport. There's small manufacturing, there's engineering, emerging technology companies. It's absolutely critical that workers from around the region be able to get to those jobs uh, because those jobs do offer family supporting wages and those jobs offer a chance for uh, upward economic mobility. Um, we, we've talked about the need um, and challenges faced by residents, employees, and clients. Let's talk now about some of the long-term durable changes that we need to see to improve transportation access um, and provide opportunities for people in greater Baltimore, especially people of color and the Alice population. Um, I'd like to hear from panelists um, what we can do to help, uh, what we can do on this call, um, what, what we all can do to help. And, you know, I mentioned at, on the BMC perspective, we're involved in a series of planning processes, um, uh, seemingly minor things like better connecting local bus stops to MTA bus stops, uh, to bigger picture structural changes that, that are going to take a long time to come together. Um, but one of, the, one of the key partners in all of these efforts are our local governments. Um, uh, Len, from a, from a local perspective, um, what is Hartford County thinking in terms of regional cooperation um, in the service that you provide? Yeah, and I, you know, I can't thank BMC enough for, for your efforts uh, as an organization to really bring uh, multiple players to the table to really talk about that regional stuff. So uh, both the state and, of, uh, of course, BMC representing uh, all, of the, all of the largest counties around uh, Baltimore, the metropolitan area. Um, you know, we do a decent job of, of serving um, our development envelope. I mentioned that earlier, where most of our jobs, most of our houses are. Uh, but connectivity is still, of course, an issue. You know, uh, we do uh, a decent job um, through, you know, Mark getting people out of the county uh, to work down in Baltimore City or, or into some other area. Um, but we don't see them coming into the county as much. And uh, we certainly have a lot of those distribution jobs, and a lot of those um, jobs that uh, have living wage uh, but we need people to, to, to get in here for. So um, certainly doing a better job of, of getting people um, out of, you know, out of some of the, the more urban areas into some of the more rural settings uh, is something that we'd like to do. So connectivity, uh, both on our bus service and our and with our, our Mark Transit service uh, coming north uh, is certainly uh, something we look at um, longer term, uh, getting into some of our rural areas is something that um, we'd certainly like to, to do more of. Um, uh, a lot of our nonprofits that support people, say in the northern end of our county, uh, would love to get a lot of those people jobs, but they just they don't have access to our system. So, as we look um, at, at future expansions, you know, as we get the dollars to do that, as as we're able to to raise the funds for for operating in this instance um, to expand our services, we look at how do we connect to to some of the the main road systems that reach that northern end. And if you could just get into the kind of our core, we can get you anywhere to work is the idea behind that. Um, and then certainly also um, timing of our system, something we're, we're constantly looking at, how do we improve um, uh, the, the bus ride? So that's Wi-Fi for our riders and, and uh, you know some of the comfort and things like that. So that once they're on our bus, um, they can be doing some things. So whether that's you know working or um, at least preparing themselves 
uh, for that work, then, then certainly that's something we're looking at. And getting people to education. Uh, I think education's a, a key, of, you know, getting that young lady uh, to school every day was was very, very important. Um, and that's certainly that something that we're looking at too with our uh, community college. How do we best serve our community college? How do we best get a network of uh, both training individuals and and then getting them employed? Um, how do we make all those connections? I think that's really in the long term what we're looking at doing and and um, certainly can always use help from from anybody who's willing to advocate on our behalf, uh, both for funding, for for networking. Um, and ideas. Um, certainly, that's all, all stuff that we'd like to see. Great. Thank you, Len. Um, Sherry, uh, you serve on the board of the Central Maryland Transportation Alliance, um, uh, along with leaders in philanthropy, higher education, and, and fellow leaders in the private sector. Um, from that perspective, from the non-government perspective, um, why is it so important that um, we continue and strive to improve the functionality of our system? Well, I've only been on the board for a few months, so don't hold me to anything. I just feel that it's very important that people can get where they have to go when they need to be there. And what we're working on with that is making for both individuals and businesses, helping to get people get around the central Maryland area. So I feel that, as we said, it's not just a individual thing. It's not just a business. It's based, it's a has to do with government, has to do with taxes, every, everything is intertwined. So if people can get where they have to go when they wanna be there, it will really just be an improve all the, all the uh, functions of a uh, working city or state. Great, thank you very much. And, and Joe, we've touched on this a little bit, but um, it, it, there is a need to dismantle uh, racial and structural inequities that are at the root of a lot of these transportation barriers. Uh, from your perspective at the Center for Urban Families, um, and speaking on behalf of the, uh, the the residents of Baltimore City that you work with, could you talk about the need to put equity at the forefront of transportation decision making? Mike, thank you, thank you for that question. I know we're we're running short on time, but I do want to lift up a couple of things relative to your question. You know, the first is going back to the decision to. Uh, discontinue the efforts to build the red line in Baltimore. Now, I'm a firm believer that if you have an existing system, in this case, a bus system, you do want to modernize it. You want to make it as efficient as you possibly can. You want to, you know, create all the bells and whistles to have a modern bus system. But a modern bus system alone is not going to get you the access and the efficient transportation access that's necessary in a 21st century economy. All right, and so we do have to think about how do we expand the transportation limitations that we currently have with having just one light rail line and one subway line uh, that you know don't really strategically connect. And the decision to not go forward with the uh, the red line, when you think about the ten years of planning, uh, the millions and millions of dollars that was uh, that were already secured from the federal government that was in play uh, that then was returned uh, you know that you can't help to think about the inequity in that decision right you you know you also think about the fact that you know you you, you talked about this earlier you don't have lo local government input and control right and when those kind of structural things exist you wonder where uh, when you take a step back and look at its origins where was the equity, where was the participation of other communities and decisions around circumstances that control the lives of, you know, people in our, 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 our urban center. And so for me, it is, you know, looking at everything through an equity lens, right? And to, to think about what's necessary. I mean, we, we understand that even if we decide to uh, bring the planning back for the red line, what was in place then looks dramatically different than now. Right, you just don't have the same plans that are appropriate for now. So you really got to go back to the starting block. But that means that we need to make an investment now, using the equity lens around that planning and decision making, so that our children and our grandchildren may benefit from it. Quite frankly, the folks who are on the screen, particularly those who you know are on the older side of the ledger, we may not be around for something like that. But we have to now have the will and the 
and the force to be able to say to our local and state leaders and our federal partners, Baltimore deserves to be a 21st century transportation driven system with rail, bus and other amenities that will allow people to have equity access to employment and the other amenities in our state that people can get exposed to and participate in. Great, Joe, thank you for that. Um, and as we come up on the one o'clock hour, I wanna thank all the panelists, all the attendees, um, certainly wanna thank Franklin and the United Way for hosting us. Um, you know, Joe's answer there is, is, is sort of a great summation to this hour. Um, it, it, it captures the breadth and um, uh, the importance of this issue for the region. Um, these are not things that are gonna be solved in the short term. Um, and for many of us, they're not going to be solved during our careers, but it's incredibly important that all of us, the nonprofit sector, the government sector, the private sector, keep working together to move it forward, and that we have partners like the United Way to keep this conversation at the forefront. Um, I believe at the end of this conversation, everybody's emails are going to be shared um, with all of our guests. Um, if there are follow-up questions, I know I'm happy to answer them down the road. Um, and to that end, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. It's been a great discussion. Um, and we are uh, looking forward to continuing this down the road. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.